Morning, and welcome to the fifth uh, special Sunday in our series of From Free Will to Freedom. Now, if you've been following uh, this series, you know that the first four Sundays, we've really been dealing with uh, tools and freedoms that we on the spiritual path are now working with, bravery, love, service and some of the tools like prayer, mantra, visualization, this kind of a thing. Um, but now, and we, we're using these tools, of course, in this great spiritual battle, which is raging uh, across earth and all the realms at this time. And in cooperation with the great cosmic masters and their cosmic plan for the salvation and enlightenment, of mankind. But you know, the indications are that this spiritual battle is not a short-lived battle. It won't end in a few weeks. Uh, it'll go on probably for lives, probably for centuries. And so we also know that the reason why we're on earth is to evolve. And so we also have to, at the same time as participate in the spiritual battle, we have to focus on our own evolution, and of course the evolution of those around us. And so these next two freedoms that we're going to be uh, looking at today, uh, enlightenment and um, cosmic consciousness, these are the next steps in our evolution. And we're also going to be looking at uh, the blessing uh, for the wise ones, which are individuals, masters, who have gone before us and have achieved either enlightenment uh, and or um, cosmic consciousness. So that's what we're going to do today. But you know, one of the great advantages uh, that I get personally from these, these uh, special services is to um, take the opportunity to really dive into uh, the blessings and especially, uh, in this case, the freedoms. And these two freedoms, enlightenment and cosmic consciousness, th there's so much in there that is very pointedly useful for each one of us right now. And it's just, it, the more you, you read and listen to these, these freedoms, there's so many layers to them. So we're only going to barely scratch the surface of them today. But I would strongly encourage you to take the time to read them, um, and if you possibly have access, to listen to these transmissions, and to, if you can, listen to the uh, lectures and commentary by a master on these two freedoms especially, because it's just, uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. Now, <clears throat> the states that we, we hear about from other traditions like nirvana, self-realization, and um, different states of samadhi, these all relate to these two freedoms, enlightenment and cosmic consciousness. But we're very fortunate that uh, the karmic lord, Mars Sector 6, has given us so much detail, detail that we've never had before on what these states, uh, these freedoms are, and how we can attain these freedoms. And that's what really we're going to do today. We're going to look at um, these two freedoms, first of all, what they, what they are, and then we're going to look at how we're told to attain them, and then we're going to look at, of course, the blessing on the wise ones, and we're going to finally uh, have a, a practice that will kind of help us along this path towards achieving these freedoms. But before I go on, um, as I was listening to these freedoms, especially um, in this case the fifth 
freedom, I came across a sentence which I've read probably dozens if not hundreds of times in the past and listened to it um, uh, probably dozens of times. But it really hit me that how incredibly well this comic lord knows mankind. And it seems that one sentence in here, he seems to be saying almost with a little glint in his eye, a little, a little smile on his face, a little bit of perhaps amusement even. And I'm going to read it to you, and I encourage you to go and listen to it and see if you, if you don't agree with me. There's a little bit of that in this particular, so I'll read that. R Sector 6. Freedom from limitation is only brought about by sincere and diligent directed effort through countless incarnations upon Terra. It is not some vague thing which just happens. It is made to happen. But that, that sentence, it's not some vague thing which just happens. It, it almost sounds like, I hate to say it, some people that you talk to that just feel that they kind of fall into samadhi or fall into this raising of kundalini or just they, they just achieved cosmic consciousness a few weeks ago and, and it was wonderful. Um, and, and here you have this, com this, this karmic lord realizing that that's the purpose of life. It takes hundreds of incarnations to achieve that. And to, to think that it just kind of happens is probably might be a little amusing to a karmic lord. You listen to it, and you, you let me know if, what you think. Now, I also came across something that I had not discovered before, and this is a, um, containing a short extract uh, by Dr. King on April 13, 1962, where he was talking about uh, this, uh, the fourth freedom. So I'd like to play over that um, just uh, for a moment. So you have to predetermine the end. Enlightenment is my goal, you must say. And in these days, it's easy to get. Do you know that? You know enlightenment is easier to get in these days than it was a couple of centuries ago. The very stuff that I'm telling you during the, the Nine Freedoms wouldn't be released to you a couple of centuries ago. You wouldn't have been able to walk through a door into a pleasant hall and get the type of truths you will get before this class is over. So enlightenment is so much easier now than it was a short time ago. You know why? Because we're on the verge of the initiation of earth. That's why. Not because humanity deserves it so much. It isn't that. It's because the times are bad, but dark indeed. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, that, isn't it? On the one hand, it is easier to attain uh, enlightenment in these days, and I think probably for a large part because of the truths that have been given to us. Um, but the other side of the coin is these truths have been given to us to speed our evolution because the times are dark. We are in this spiritual battle. And so it's kind of a two-edged sword. But let's take the positive side right now. And it's easier to attain enlightenment. And so we're going to talk about that today. So I'd like now to turn over the podium to Reverend Ashima, who will start the uh, service aspect of today. Greetings. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to be able to be a part of this special service, to share this journey with you all. So let's now prepare ourselves by using some visualization practices, sit up straight, so that we can open ourselves up Raise our consciousness to receive the wisdom and light 
during this service in order that we will become better channels ourselves to send out even more light and healing to our world. So let's now take a few slow, long, deep breaths. Take our focus to the here and now. Then let's now see in the ethers above a beautiful pink radiance. Guide this down to the head and brain. Down the spine at the back. Wrap it around the base of the spine. Up the front of the body till it reaches the top of the head. Then repeat this once more. Guide this pink radiance down the spine at the back. Around the base of the spine, up the front of the body, till it reaches the top of the head once again. And as a balance to this, request most humbly from the Mother Earth for her violet flame of transmutation and protection to cause upwards through your body and aura all the way up as far as you can visualize it seeing all the draws being transmuted while you bathe in this violet flame. Then seeing the ethers above, a brilliant white light Guide this down to the head and brain. And let it amalgamate with every cell within the brain. Then guide it down the neck and shoulders and into the heart center. Then detach from this visualization and adopt the holy mudra from mantra if you have received it. And we'll be reciting mantra. And if you have not been initiated into the mantra that we use today, I would ask you to please place your palm upwards on your knees and just let the energy flow through you. And please do not join in the recitation. Om many pan me hum, 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 om many pan me hum. Om many pan me hum, om many pan me hum, om many pan me hum. Now that we've charged ourselves up, I would ask you to please join with me in the prayer for spiritual workers as given by the Master Jesus so that we can all become better spiritual warriors to help our world. Please raise your hands and remember to bring down this vibrant white light from the ethers 
and request this to flow through you, out through the palm centers, as well as your heart center, out into the world. Almighty God, I bless all those who, because of their limitations, would smite me. Almighty God, I bless all those who, because of their weakness, would not heed me. Almighty God, I bless all those who, because of their ignorance, would defile you through me. And I ask, Almighty God, O wondrous power, that your strength may be given to me now, so that I might be fortified by this, so that I might go forward bravely into the world, and despite reception, send forth my love of thee throughout all races of man. Almighty God, give me the power and strength to rise above my karmic weakness, the deficiencies in the pattern of my evolution, so that I might evolve and become stronger, I and even stronger, in thy everlasting light. O oh God, thy will be done. Please lower your hands now, and I would now invite the Right Reverend Brian Kniep to come back out to officially start the service. So as I mentioned, the first part of today, we're going to be... Um, looking at what these two freedoms are. And as I mentioned, they've been given in, in greater detail uh, than ever before on Earth. And the Master, uh, Mar Mara Sector 6, the great karmic lord, states very clearly what enlightenment is in the fourth freedom. He says, quote, Know this. Enlightenment is freedom from ignorance. That's what enlightenment is. It's freedom from ignorance. Of course, we've also been told that the only sin on earth is ignorance. And so it illustrates how important enlightenment is. But it, the intimation is that enlightenment is not some state which you reach and then you have. It's a process uh, through continued um, raising of the Kundalini, as we'll find out in a minute, um, and opening the psychic centers over um, years and lives. You slowly gain greater and greater and greater enlightenment. And so let's go into this a little bit more deeply. So one statement that Mars at a six makes is on the road to enlightenment. This great being says, contemplation with open-minded diligence, which will bring about a greater awareness, a greater understanding, and which will begin to open the door of enlightenment. So the earlier things which we'll get into, or concentration, you know, service, etc. Then you, then you get to a place where you're being able to contemplate, and that is beginning to open the door. And our master has said contemplation is um, a rise of Kundalini to the solar plexus area. Not a complete rise, but, a, but a, a partial rise of the Kundalini into the solar plexus, which will give you uh, the early stages of contemplation. And that begins to open the door. And then this great karmic lord goes on. The next essential step he can then take is a transmutation of mental energies 
upon the plane of inspiration called high intuition. This is brought about by strict control and the manipulation of the individual's karmic pattern through service and so on. At this stage, he is then capable of meditation. Through such meditation, the aspirant opens the door even wider so that the brilliant, everlasting vibration of enlightenment may forever surround him. So this analogy of a door really does uh, bring to mind a process. You start to open it, you open it wider and wider and wider through meditation. It's a long-term process. And our master, in his commentary, states that the only way you can achieve meditation is through the control and the raise, raising of that great power of Kundalini. That's the only way you can achieve this meditation, which you need to achieve enlightenment. So let's listen now to a description by our master, Dr. George King, of what exactly meditation is. This also was given on April 13th, 1962. You've got to learn concentration, you've got to learn contemplation, then you've got to work like the very devil in service, so you manipulate your own karma in order to get the next stage, which is meditation. When you can meditate, my friends, then you uh, uh, can begin to get enlightenment. Until then, you're only going towards enlightenment. You haven't got it yet. Through such meditation, the aspirant opens the door to even wider so that the brilliant, everlasting vibration of enlightenment may forever surround him. What is meditation? Meditation is always taken in a very, very deep trance state. A deep meditation uh, is brought about by the operation of Kundalini up through the certain psychic center, and the Kundalini is then lodged in the heart center, at least the heart center. If you don't get it any higher, if you don't get it to the throat, or Ajahn, or the Christ center, if you like, you can still have meditation if it's lodged correctly in the heart center. You are in very deep trance, you are totally paralyzed, you cannot possibly move, the body is cold, the heart has nearly stopped beating, you are consciously dead. Meditation is conscious death. And those are some of the greatest words ever said about it on this earth. Conscious death, that's what it is. With you, with you, the thinker, the mental man inside, absolutely alive living for the first time in your life, by the way. It's a beautiful explanation of meditation. And so we know that heart center, throat center, third eye center, all of these will give you deeper degrees of meditation, deeper states of enlightenment. And so again, we're back to this idea of a gradual uh, accumulation, if we will, of enlightenment, a, a, a gradual ridding oneself of ignorance. And it's probably a bad analogy, but I'll try. Uh, an analogy of learning to read on earth. As little, little tots, we go to school and we spend some years learning our alphabets and words and putting words together and grammar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all love English, don't we? No? But we, we, learn, we learn to read, uh, and, but clearly the goal isn't to learn to read. You learn to read so that, that's a tool that you can then read. And you can find books that, that uh, appeal to you and learn more and more and more knowledge so that, that you can then go out to the world and hopefully give even more powerful and more potent service to our brothers and sisters through the knowledge you gain through reading. And I think that we're being told that meditation, um, that the process th towards enlightenment 
is the same kind of a thing. You go into meditation, um, heart center, throat center, over, over years, lives, and each time you do, we're told the mind is absolutely alive because we're learning and we're choosing what to learn. We, we, can, we can send our mind to different places and different things and learn different aspects of life. And through that, we then come back down, we take the Kundalini back down, and then we go out in our physical body, physical structure, and are able to give even more powerful service than ever before. This enlightenment is a tool, a tool to help us help others. And of course, it's on the road to the next freedom, cosmic consciousness. And here, that great karmic lord gives such a beautiful explanation of our path from where we are today to cosmic consciousness. So I'd like to play, this is actually two extracts from this freedom uh, sewn together with a, with a brief um, couple of second uh, thing in between. So listen to this and, uh, and for this one, I really would re request that you sit up straight, um, really quiet your mind, close your eyes and, and take in this profound, beautiful wisdom given to us by this great karmic lord, Mars Sector 6. There comes a stage when the a desire a to break forever the bars of selfishness adorns service is performed there comes a following stage when enlightenment alike a sun a doth flood the server with its a golden light wisdom adorns there comes a stage when at once the consciousness of the individual soars to mighty heights unlimited unbounded by mind high into the realms of intuition of divine inspiration it goeth through space where time stands quite still non-existent immobile cosmic a consciousness like the flower of God breaks from a bud into full lasting bloom. The spark of God resides in man untouched until man makes this cosmic step even then he toucheth not this flame, but liveth with all feeling through 
its brilliant radiations. A light which passeth mere foolish a verbose description. And yet is passive. I think we can all agree that that's a couple of sentences which we'll be contemplating and meditating on for lives to come. What a beautiful, powerful description of evolution on Earth. We, through service, we have freedom from selfishness, from Enlightenment, we have freedom from ignorance. And through cosmic consciousness, we gain freedom from limitation. What a beautiful, simply put, but so beautifully put, description of our evolution on Earth. Now there's another aspect in the fifth freedom, which I wanted to touch upon. And again, we're just scratching the surface of these two amazing freedoms. <clears throat> but this one is important, I think, to all of us. And again, this is the great comic lord Mar Sector Six in the fifth freedom. Indeed is this step to lasting freedom and at its zenith, what? Continuance? Nay. This the great test. At its zenith, detachment. Detachment through every stage back to limitation. This is the essence of adeptship, not acceptance as much as detachment. So the adept detaches, taking from his glorious violet head the golden crown of cosmic consciousness to leave it in the supra mind belt. And of course, this is something that we, we discover in many of the blessings and many of the freedoms. This idea of uh, getting to a stage um, and then rejecting it and dropping back down to help those um, behind you to help other aspects of God go up. And in the Ethereum Society, we are extremely fortunate to have a living pattern of someone who not only uh, left a more evolved planet to come to this planet, but even while he was here, he achieved that great state of cosmic consciousness and even wrote about it in the Nine Freedoms. And again, took off the crown and came back down to live amongst us on earth in our unevolved states. And to watch him was uh, just a tremendous honor and a great education for all of us who had that privilege. And I wanted to just um, relay one story which illustrates that even though uh, an individual, like a master or anyone who goes into cosmic consciousness, comes back down, they, even though they're living in the physical body and using just their physical brain, their consciousness, um, they still have, uh, shall we say, very interesting powers. And this one I think you'll agree with me when I explain this one. He, uh, Dr. King, again, one of the great things that uh, Dr. King was able to do and did for us by rejecting uh, what he could have had and staying on this, this level with us was inventing some great cosmic missions. And we'll get into those in the upcoming Sundays. And one of these is Operation Sunbeam, where um, energy is sent 
through equipment built by, uh, designed by Dr. King, built by the Ethereum Society, into a psychic center of the Mother Earth uh, in sacrifice, uh, as a token repayment to the Mother Earth. And so this, one phase of this was going on in England, uh, from the north of England into a psychic center in Scotland, uh, Loch Ness. And um, so the equip equipment is set up, and these great evolved beings from another system called Gotha, these great cosmic masters, they manipulate the energy from the equipment in a way to the psychic center of the Mother Earth. So this is going on. And so Dr. I had set Dr. King up in Santa Barbara for his cocktail time. Okay. He was sitting there in a lounge uh, with a scotch, a bit of 7-Up, a bit of ice, cigarette, music on his Macintosh stereo system in the background, relaxing, or so one would think. And, um, and this would have been around the time that um, this, this phase of Operation Sunbeam had commenced. And so a little time goes by, and I, and I hear him shout my name. So I come out and see what he wants, and he wants me to run and get his tape recorder. So I run down to the other end of the house, bring it back, and he gets on the tape recorder, and he, and he says very abruptly, very out of character, he says, what is it then? Um, and he's talking to the masses from Gotha. And um, conversations ensue. He gets uh, Adam Nix 005 involved. Uh, and basically, a, uh, a problem with the manipulation of this energy was discovered and fixed. So the amazing thing to me was that Dr. King, in his limited physical structure, using his brain, sitting on a chair, listening to music, drinking a scotch, smoking a cigarette, tuned into this mission and discovered that there was a problem with the energy transfer before the cosmic masters, the Gotha masters, who were manipulating the energy, knew about it. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And yet, he had rejected the powers. He, wasn't, he, he couldn't read my mind. I'm not saying that if he really wanted to, he couldn't, but he, he, he didn't. He couldn't easily, shall we say, read people's minds. He wasn't projecting anywhere. He was just living in a physical body, having his oatmeal in the morning, um, walks in the afternoon, going to sleep like a normal person. And yet, he was able to tune in to this incredibly um, delicate mission 6,000 miles away before even the masters who were manipulating the energy detected it. And this gives kind of an idea that you, you reject the powers you come back, and then you use your enlightenment to further um, those who you are coming, staying back to help. And you have, shall we say, a certain magic about you. Now that takes care of what these two beautiful states are. And I'd now like to invite Reverend Shimon back to the podium to... Uh, take us into the second blessing. I think many of you tuning in are probably familiar with the Twelve Blessings as a sacred text, as well as more importantly, using it as a mystic practice to send out light and healing to our world. And just a few words on the reading that I'm about to do. And it is taken from the foreword, and these are words of Dr. King. Uh, it is taken from the foreword of the 12 blessings. Um, and I was really staggered when I came across this because in this extract, Dr. King, he mentions specifically that using the 12 blessings will help us progress towards the state of enlightenment and cosmic consciousness. 
So I would ask you to now please sit up straight to receive the wisdom from Dr. King about the importance of the 12 blessings and how it can help us on our evolution. Dr. King, the 12 blessings have been given so that by their continuous study as profound truths and use as mystic practices, the student may better prepare himself for the journey into the enlightened state of cosmic consciousness. The energy released by the student must be returned from the point to which it was directed. The 12 blessings, therefore, constitute a system of sacred practices by the continued use of which the student may avail himself of the energy necessary to gain enlightenment. Even more important than this, the student can be energized to that extent, which enables him to be of great service to all humanity. It is this type of service through spiritual enlightenment, which the earth so desperately needs in these dark days. It was to bring about a spiritual revitalization of earth that Jesus released his transmuting power of pure selfless love during these blessings. So for me, it is most inspiring to hear that using this beautiful practice that we have been given by the Master Jesus through our beloved Master, not only are we able to help the world, but we're able to advance ourselves at the same time toward these two states that you're learning more about today in this service. And we will then play for you two short extracts of about a minute long each. And they are taken from two different lectures by Dr. King given in 1960. And in the first extract, we will learn more about who the wise ones are so please now play the first extract. The wise ones, says Jesus, are they who work, walk through a dark and ignorant world spreading their light, spreading their teachings. People who have gone within, contacted the all-knowledge space which is there, in other words, gone into the state of meditation, real meditation, not the excuse for it, real meditation, and have come out again to give their wisdom to others. These are the wise ones, the knowers throughout the earth. And they're working in many different ways, in many different countries, right throughout the earth, giving their wisdom to others so that others may be helped. And in the next extract, we will learn how vital the presence of the wise ones are on our earth. So can we please listen to the next extract? These are great ones. Without these, this world could not endure, says Jesus. And he's right, it could not endure. It wouldn't last no longer than another 10 seconds without these, it could not, or at least humanity on it, could not last. It's the minority that are keeping what karmic balance there is now existing on earth. 
many people are helping them, many spiritual groups throughout the earth without fully realizing what they are doing are helping this minority, oh yes, 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 but it's that minority. It is truly incredible to hear that we cannot do without these wise ones for just 10 seconds, as Dr. King mentioned. So with these thoughts in our mind, and to prepare ourselves further, before we join together in the second blessing to the wise ones, I would like to read the following words by the Master Jesus, which he delivered following the second blessing. The Master Jesus. Adorable ones, little children, I am here with you. I will lead you into this state if you will but hold out your hand to me. So let's remember whenever we perform this mystic practice, hold out our hands and really open our hearts to join with the Master Jesus. And for today, we will send our love, our blessing, our gratitude to the wise ones to help these most compassionate beings in their work to spread light and wisdom to our world. And please note that as we normally do in this special series of services, we will only be playing an extract instead of the full blessing that you are accustomed to. So this, ex this extract actually is made up of three um, separate extracts within the blessing itself. So let's now sit up straight and prepare ourselves to join with the Master Jesus. Blessed are the wise ones, for they walk a through a dark and ignorant world. Spreading their light These are the ones who have gone within deep within and made a glorious and lasting contact with the spark which dwelleth there these a ones have found peace and have turned away from it to give its very essence, its very core to searching, groping, unpeaceful man. These are great ones. For 
without these This world could not endure thrice blessed are the searchers who have found and left and given of their very heart a to man. Please keep your hands raised and join with me in the prayer following the third blessing. And if you do not know the words, just focus on sending out a white, vibrant beam of energy out to our world. Almighty God, who is the creator of all things, we pray that your light may shine through us all so that we may transmit this unto the world. Please lower your hands. And I would like to now introduce the next segment by reading an extract from The Fifth Freedom, Cosmic Consciousness. To learn how we are to achieve the two freedoms of enlightenment and cosmic consciousness. Mars Sector 6. Freedom from limitation is only brought about by sincere and diligent directed effort through countless incarnations upon Terra. It is not some vague thing which just happens. It is made to happen. Terra is a great classroom Pupils have come to learn many lessons. They pass from grade to grade through countless initiations, through countless apparent deaths. When they cast off gross physical limitation for a time and travel to another more subtle plane to learn, then to return again to benefit from their previous experiences. So let this linger in your mind for a bit, and I would now invite the right Reverend Brian Kniep to come back out to the lectern. Thank you, Reverend. I still love that quote. Even though we're told that enlightenment is easier in these days, it still is not just some vague thing that will just happen. Afraid. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how to attain these freedoms. And that's really, you know, that's why we're here. So it is a very important subject. And in that last reading um, from Mars Sector 6, he really puts across the idea that um, th there's so, so many aspects that 
Uh, we have to get in alignment, if you will, to achieve these freedoms. And you know, we, we're living in, the, in this kind of plane on Earth with our families and works and all that kind of stuff, and, and we're struggling with that. Um, but you know, there, there's so many other aspects. Like he mentions that when you when you pass away, when you die, you go to another realm, and you have another life. There, it's the kind of two concurrent lives that you've got going, and so you've got to get all of that lined up. Uh, when you sleep at night, you, you kind of do other things. You've got to get that lined up. Uh, when you start doing spiritual practices, you have to kind of get that lined up. So there's a lot of ingredients um, that we really need to, to get in order. And all, always realizing behind all that that the real tool, the real um, goal is to harness this power of Kundalini and raise it up the Sushumna to open up the psychic centers because that's when we will really start to get enlightenment. So let's get into it. So Mark 6, six does say that um, bravery, first freedom, dispensation of pure love, second freedom, service, third freedom. These attributes can help the aspirant to bring enlightenment into being. But in a way, those attributes plant you firmly on the path. And then you have to, as I mentioned, get all of these ingredients right. And it it can seem overwhelming. Certainly it seems overwhelming to me. Um, but remember that we don't have to figure it out with our conscious mind. Thank goodness for that. Uh, but we have our higher selves, which plays a very prominent role in helping us evolve, of course. Um, we're told that we choose our parents. And we choose where we're born, when we're born. We choose the major um, difficulties uh, and advantages in life. We choose all these different main aspects that happen to us. And so if we're smart, we'll look at these, these clues, look at our major events, um, uh, the difficult people, the helpful people that we bring into our lives, and look at that in a way of what's my higher self sending me. You might also think, what was my higher self thinking? Is my higher self really having a lot of fun with me? Hopefully not. But the higher self is sending you tools to help you evolve. You know, we, we all look around, certainly I do, certainly have. You look around and you see people say, man, they're really lucky. They got this great family, they got a like really, really nice house, or great job. Um, they're, they're psychic, you know, or they, they can really, people get mad at them and it doesn't affect them. They're really lucky people. If I was like that, it would be so much easier for me to kind of get ahead. And, but when you think about it, there is no such thing as luck. Uh, if you're psychic this life, you worked really hard last life. If you've got a really beautiful situation um, on earth, you worked hard for that last life. And so maybe because I'm now in my 60s, uh, I'm starting to think a little bit like trying to kind of plant some seeds for your next life. You know? And we're even told this in the teaching different, in different ways. But you know, the more that you do service, the more that you work on yourself, um, your difficulties, et cetera, you're planting seeds so that next life you won't have the frustrations that you have now. You'll be that quote unquote lucky guy. Um, and, and, and for us on the path, that means we'll have so much greater ability to help others. And that's really what we on the path really, really want to do. So, Let's get into the details. Marshall de Six emphasizes 
uh, that it's, it's a very multifaceted um, project, this enlightenment. And this great being states, quote, enlightenment is a result of the controlled application of specific energies and procedures towards a predetermined end. Sounds pretty scientific, pretty precise, and it is. But he breaks it down for us uh, into three main categories. First one, Mars to six, physical man can predetermine the end of his physical energy and cause this to be used in the best sense according to the law. And I venture to think that most people on the path have got that pretty well sorted out. We don't go around killing people, stealing things from people. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty good, by and large, on this aspect. Mental, that's another question. Mark chapter 6, mental man can so control his picturization that he can direct his mental energies towards a goal which is an all-wise constructive, a goal of service, of spiritual cooperation. And I think this really is where we have the main work to do, uh, certainly myself anyway, on Earth. And that is, you know, we know what we have to, we know we have to concentrate. We know we have to control our visualizations. We have to control our emotions. Uh, we have to be able to um, really focus our minds when we, maybe we don't want to. And it's really difficult. It's hard. We know what we have to do, but you can't, it, it, to coin the phrase, it doesn't just happen. Right? Got to really work at it. So I'd like to now play over an extract um, from, our, from our master, again, talking about um, the fourth freedom. And he gives us, I think, uh, some very hopeful and helpful advice on this front. A great beam of creative, controlled mental energy can be directed towards all terrestrials so that those who are ready will be mentally transmuted by this constructive creative beam of energy creative <laughs> beam of energy a beam of transmutation a, something that builds but does not destroy now we have to be almost diabolically honest with ourselves in this thing. And if we are honest with ourselves, we will admit we have had destructive thoughts many times, if we are honest. Well, the thing to do, if you admit that, you are halfway towards conquering it. Because a light of honesty has dawned in you and you can, after recognizing your own shortcomings, you can do something about them. But woe unto the man who will not recognize these shortcomings, because such a one deserves all prayers. Don't dwell in a negative attitude on your faults, because you make them. Don't dwell on them. But say, I will learn from these, and in a relaxed manner, with quiet, gentle confidence. You know, they say that still waters run deep. It's not in, in, a, in, a, in a sea that you see the turbulence as you do in a waterfall. And yet there's greater power in the sea than in all the waterfalls put together. Still waters run deep. Still waters are the powerful ones. So be calm and relaxed and still about this. But say to yourself gently and firmly, well, this is a chink in my armor. I will put it right. And the more you try to do this, it's as though the sky is open and you are given a greater health and a, gre uh, a greater help and a greater strength to do this. You don't know where you get your help and strength, help and strength from, but it comes to you. Isn't a doubt? Isn't a doubt? 
you are helped as though you, something is pushing you on, guiding you, helping you in every way. If you affirm and say, these things will I control. My mental picturizations, these are the things I will control. The first step, you can't get enlightenment, my friends, until you do it. You can read all the books on earth and you will still know nothing. You can hear all the lectures on earth and you will still know nothing unless you begin the control within yourself. That's it. That's it. It does give you a bit, a bit of hope that we, we can uh, control these, these things. And again, that's just the mental. We've done physical, mental, and now, uh, in many respects, um, the last and most important and most necessary is psychic. So Mars 6 has this to say, Psychic man can so control his subtle universal life forces that he can bring about strict mental control. By so doing, he is capable of concentration. And of course, we read earlier the extension of that, which is next step is contemplation and the meditation. And that really is the essence, is, is through, that's the, that's the psychic aspect, that's the spiritual practice aspect. So you've got the physical, you've got the mental with the brain and thoughts and emotions and whatnot, and then you've got the psychic, which is concentration, uh, med you know, meditation, contemplation, uh, mantras, breathing. These are the things that we need to utilize to control uh, our psychic aspect, which really means controlling the universal life forces, controlling the prana within us to enable us to raise that kundalini. That is the last um, step. And in vintage master style, he tells us how to do that. Let's listen to this very short and interesting 50-second extract. Uh, and they are learning the control of the subtle universal life forces. They can't control them yet, but they're learning this control. One good way to learn this control is by uh, 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 practicing uh, a deep breathing, uh, if you can do this without any physical harm to you. If it brings physical harm to you, then there's something wrong. Then this brings concentration, contemplation, meditation. The result, enlightenment. It's kind of simple. Real simple. It's like all great things. It's really simple. Here I think he was really putting on his hat as an interplanetary being, coming to this world and seeing this tremendous stress and all these problems and difficulties and ignorance, etc. And you, you got to think, I suppose, when you're someone like that, you say, God, it's so easy. It's so simple not to be in that state. Just do service. Do the breathing exercises. Raise, raise the Kundalini. How, what, where's the complication there? And, it, and it's true. It is true. He said that to me one time, which I won't go into again, but he, you know, it, it is true. It's, um, uh, especially with the nine freedoms, we know exactly what we have to do. All we have to do is to do it. And on that front, we now move into the last section, which is practice. And of course, what else could we possibly do in practice than do the first breathing in our master's course of breathing? But before we do, I, I also discovered, again, this is the advantage of doing research um, on these classes. You, get, you find these little nuggets, and so I like to share these nuggets. So this nugget is on the kundalini. And uh, again, that is the most important tool that we have is to raise that power of Kundalini up the Sashumna to 
the higher centers, and eventually Brahma Chakra. So what is the Kundalini? This is what our master says. So the great power of Kundalini is strange. Like truth, it is within man and yet not within man. The power of Kundalini is in manifestation. It is held directly in the life stream of the earth, as well as being lodged in the perfect portable cyclotron, which you carry around with you everywhere you go, which of course is your spine. And at the bottom of this is the Kundalini, all ready to rise and burn out the dross of ignorance within you. And here we come complete circle back to enlightenment where we're told that enlightenment is the, the absence of ignorance. And this kundalini force is waiting there to rise up through Sushumna to burn off the dross of ignorance. And the reason why I mention all this is I think that as you do your breathing exercises, especially the more uh, advanced um, kundalini breathing exercises uh, which uh, are available, you, you can remember that this kundalini force that you're working with is yet another precious gift given to us by the Mother Earth herself. It's an aspect of the Mother Earth within us. Another great sacrifice she's given for us to use to evolve through these wonderful freedoms. Now, the first breathing, it's um, this well, the breathing exercises, I also want to um, really hopefully inspire people to use these breathing exercises. There's, there's dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of breathing exercises on earth today. But the breathing exercises given to us by His Eminence Sir George King, I think are very special. And if you think about it, he was told to do these breathing exercises. And so he needed to do these breathing exercises before he was able to bring through um, the Master Aetherius and the other great masters through somatic trance condition. And he, he, by the way, he was already at least an adept at that time. And he was, he was told to do these breathing exercises. That's pretty amazing in and of itself. But on top of that, he then took these breathing exercises tweaked them slightly so that they'd be more helpful for us, and then gave them to us. I mean, can you imagine a greater set of breathing exercises possible on Earth? And they're, they're very simple. They're very simple practices. So I strongly encourage you, if you possibly can, to do these breathing exercises. So today, we're just going to do the first uh, which is really just an exercise, um, it's the first breathing that uh, Dr. King tells us to do prior to doing the, uh, the full set for at least two weeks, or as he says, a fortnight, um, before so that you can kind of get your body ready for these simple yet very powerful breathing exercises. And it's really very simple. Um, you, he does say it's better to sit on the floor. So if you can sit on the floor um, in Siddhasana, even better. If you can do that, all the better. If you can't, don't worry about it in the slightest. Sit in a chair um, and just relax yourself. Relax your shoulders. Quiet your mind. And then just breathe through both nostrils and get yourself to a state where you, the in-breath and out-breath are even. Do a nice long breath in, 
long breath out, even. You can just do that now while I'm talking. Have everything relaxed. Eyes closed, of course. Slow breathing. And as he says in his book, the length of the breath should become equal as you calm yourself and carry on with this breathing. And if you know the, the yoga breath, use that. Otherwise, just remember to kind of pull your diaphragm in slightly on the out breath, so it's a more complete out breath. Nice, slow, relaxed breathing. And you might find at this stage, you'll start getting lots of thoughts coming into your mind. Just let them flow through your mind and don't attach to any of them. And then eventually, he reckons to do this for 15 minutes, and eventually you get to the place where the thoughts have quieted themselves down, the in and out breath have become equal, and then he says you should add an affirmation, a mental affirmation. I am now purifying my mind and body. And just repeat this over and over silently as you keep the breath equal in, equal out. I am now purifying my mind and body. Nice, long, slow, deep breaths. I am now purifying my mind and body. And affirmation is one of the great secrets of mind control. You can use different affirmations given in his yoga book as you're at a line or driving your car and your mind is running around being monkey mind, use an affirmation. I'm now purifying my mind and body. Relaxed. Keep the shoulders relaxed, spine erect, head not forward, but if anything, a little bit back. I'm now purifying my mind and body. Slow, deep, equal breaths. I'll draw that to a close. I think even just a couple of minutes you can feel the beautiful, calming, and energizing effect of this first breathing. And it's something that you can, this is a breathing that you can use uh, by itself. The other ones really you, you want to do as a, as a full routine, but this first breathing you can certainly do by itself if you feel anxious or upset um, or emotional. You can sit down and do this first breathing at any time. So that brings our excursion into these two freedoms and this one blessing to a close. And again, remember, we've only just scratched the surface. Uh, the next step is for you to uh, take it further yourself, read the book, the books, listen to the transmissions, the lectures, and above all, practice. 
So let's now close the practice of the presence. Left hand on the solar plexus, right hand over the left. Sit up straight. Shoulders relaxed, mind alert. And think down to the wondrous Mother Earth and humbly request her violet flame of transmutation to flow upwards through the feet, legs, body, upwards into the heart center. Fill this great center of love, this great center where meditation starts, the heart center. Fill this, this energy of the Mother Earth herself. And then visualize a brilliant white light from high above the earth. Flow down, filling the head and brain. These high centers fill them with this brilliant essence of almighty God itself. Feel its vibration, its power, its energy. And bring this down the neck and flow this also into the heart center. So you have both the white light, the violet flame, filling the heart center. And bring these two energies together as one, merge them, and then send them upwards, out into the golden sphere, just above the top of the head, the spark of God. Offer these energies in sacrifice to this great spark. And then gently request from this aspect of God itself that the golden rays of spirituality might flow down from this spark, down filling the brain, the consciousness, the mind, the neck, shoulders, the heart center, through the body right to the feet and at the ground, this wonderful, all-pervasive golden light. I will, O oh mighty God, be done.